Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mimi, and on behalf of the team, it's my great pleasure to welcome you for this Agora Talk. And today we have the chance to have Katie Yuke with us. Uh, Katie is a curator whose research centers around new media, diaspora, and socially engaged practices. She got a solid practice home at Tate Creative Time and Lisson Gallery, to name only a few. Katie has recently recently curated exhibitions, performances, screenings, and events at Cubit Gallery. She also contributed writing for ICA London, This Is Tomorrow, plus the catalogue for Goldsmith's Digital Culture Degree Show. And now I'll hand over to Super Katie, who is the moderator and the curator of this talk. Katie, it's up to you now. Thank you, Mimi. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie. As Mimi said, I'm a curator at Agora. Thank you for tuning in with us for this iteration of Agora's talks program. And we're thrilled to be joined by Istanbul-based filmmaker Elif Ada. I had the pleasure to research Elif's work and saw that she has a background in both cognitive psychology and also in filmmaking from NYU. And I really saw that her interdisciplinary thinking was coming up through her work. I was introduced to Jacob Levy Moreno as well, the pioneer of group psychotherapy who is quoted in the event description today. I learned about his method, which is heavily rooted in theater and psychology. It's kind of the opposite to a Freudian kind of approach to individual therapy, and it's more based in role play and dramatization. So Elif has been writing and directing films for over 10 years and has written and directed radio plays, short films, a web series. And in 2017, she made a feature length period drama entitled Tough Times, which was selected for several national and international festival competition selections. So earlier this year, right before COVID hit, she made her first VR performance entitled The Thing Between Us, which was exhibited in the You Are Prettier This Way exhibition in Istanbul, which is on view until tomorrow, in case you're in Istanbul. And we have the pleasure of talking more about this piece today. So we're going to start by viewing the work, which is just three minutes. It's more of a representation of the work as it's intended to be viewed in VR. So just please do bear that in mind. So thank you, Elif Ada, for being here with us and welcome. So yeah, feel free to tell us a bit more about this work and okay. what motivated you to make uh, it. Uh, first, I should be thanking you guys for bringing us together and for giving me this opportunity. And also thank you all the participants to be here. Well, I know that you guys are <laughs> looking forward to hear how digital art can make you fall in love. We will come to that. Hopefully, <laughs> but first I'm gonna make an inadvisable introduction. I you know I'm a filmmaker, uh, not an expert on on digital arts. This was my first experience with digital arts, uh, and I'm here to share this personal experience and how it kind of affected, changed, or shaped my idea, my perception of narrative, in a way. Yeah, it was the first time that I worked with VR reality, and this was shot 360 degree camera thing and this was the first time as well for me and i need to tell one more boring detail like katie mentioned this but i just want to make it more clear this video was not uh, produced to be seen this way i mean it's it's for the vr headset why i'm putting too much pressure on this is because it's the gaze that i'm looking for to make it more visible what gaze it's the societal gaze that I'm dealing with in almost all my works because I don't know if maybe I should introduce this a little bit, the history that I'm feeding myself. Back in 90s, while I was wearing a hijab and I just stopped wearing it publicly like four months ago, I had been wearing it since I was 13 years old. Back in 90s, uh, there was this ban, the hijab ban, which I, in Turkey, which I don't like to call it hijab ban because well, basically, they are not banning the hijab. I was wearing it. They are banning me, right? So I took it personally. So there was the hijab ban, and like it, kind it, uh, it continued like mid two thousand ten. So I was dealing with that, and while I was dealing with that, I mean, was like I wasn't, you know, like comfortably having the opportunity to have education or like work in the 
places that I want to work, etc. I'm, I'm not going to make this the story. The thing is, for me, I have lived through that for like 10 years, 20 years, and I became a filmmaker, but I was too shy or like too silent about making this turning this into a story because I was feeling like it wouldn't be understood because it was me who lived that, who experienced that. And I know that it's a debatable issue. There are lots of other ideas about it. Some people supported the band, some people did not, but still couldn't understand why it was so emotionally destructive for us as women who are wearing hijab. And so there was just all this ideas that floating around and when i started talking about it people were like at some point going blue screen so i prefer not to include it in my works except the web series like five years ago i shot and it was a it was a different although it was still a different way of putting it so when this idea first came to me when they uh, first came to me saying that okay here we are going to make an exhibition about that you know, process back in 90s, how women experienced that period. I was a bit worried if I would be able to communicate how I felt about it. So I was thinking like, what's, why I am shying back, why I am taking myself back from talking about it. And I realized that it's the, it's basically kind of shared for all of us, like common for all of us. And there's this knowledge on earth that no one no one can know and no one can share except oneself like ourselves it's the personal experience yeah and it's one thing being katie and watching this you know talk or like being i don't know megan or like ellen uh, or or and watching this it's it's all different worlds and it's specifically your own experience and there's no way no exact certain way for me to understand it. What motivated me being a filmmaker at first place? To make that personal experience as much visible as possible. You know, as I dive into narrative techniques, I see that it, there is, it is limited. It's really limited to make that personal experience understandable to other person. So this, this work or like this period where hijab ban was on was so personal and so kind of intimate and like full of emotions for me. Uh, I was scared that I would screw it up, basically, <laughs> if I use the narrative techniques, you know, because if you want to create empathy through narrative techniques, it's, it's easy or like sympathy through narrative techniques like classical narrative techniques, it's, it's easy. Like make the main character white male and <laughs> make that male person, you know, caress a dog or like play with the kids and ta-da, you know, you're there. You're, you're, you're sympathetic to that character. But this is a really debatable issue. Everyone has a very political idea uh, and their own very closed, very stagnated ideas about these women. So it's really hard to break them, break into that mindset. I needed, I needed something more. Uh, what I realized when I started talking about what, how I experienced that period was the, the people's feedback. They were like, as if that period never happened, as if nothing happened back then, like as if I had some kind of a schizophrenic pandemic or like an illness back then, and I had some delusional stuff, and now I'm talking about it. So I realized that it's reality is changing through who's looking at it. That's again personal experience. The key word was there was reality. When we were discussing this with my creator, with the creator of the exhibition, she said, if this is an issue of reality, maybe we should try like virtual reality techniques. So that was, that was the first time that I'm like maybe saying maybe to this because I have been working in like this uh, classical narrative techniques for the last 10 years and I have never worked with virtual reality, you know, with 360 degree cameras. It's a whole different world to me, but it was appealing. It's calling for me because you're, you're dealing with reality itself. 
you're creating your reality and making the other person share that reality through some devices, which is interesting. So I started thinking what was making me more uncomfortable back then. Of course, like on a state level, there were some political, some unacceptable politics, like discriminated politics towards women. I mean, women who are wearing hijab cannot go to school, they cannot go, go work there, do that, do that, do that. But to me, that wasn't, that wasn't the most uncomfortable part. To me, the most uncomfortable part is the gaze the looks that I'm getting on the street while I'm walking, while I'm, I don't know, shopping, while I'm talking. It's such an interesting way of punishing people who are marginal because no one can, you know, point a finger to that. It's not concrete. You can't say that this, that did this to me. You can only say she's looking or he's looking at me as if I'm something unacceptable. As if so, I'm, I shouldn't be here. And you feel it and you know that that's real. So I decided to make that gaze as much visible as possible. So I tried to make that gaze visible through this piece. So, and I had the device, you know, I had that, you know, people are really putting that Google's on, that headset on, and they are now face to face with me. They are putting on the glasses and they are. I am welcoming them into my world, which is, which is there I am sitting and taking off my hijab. It's an endless process because that's how I felt back then. Like it's like people are looking at you in a way, people are talking about you in a way that there's nothing else about you but the hijab. It's almost like you feel like you're a, giant huge textile walking on the streets you know like nothing left from you it's just the hijab so like that's the context was back then and sometimes still it's going on like with with women wearing hijab it's almost like they are either putting it on or taking it off that's the only thing they do other than that they don't exist, they don't drink, they don't dance, they don't sing, they don't cry. It's just putting on the hijab or taking it out. So that was the, that was the world that's built around that uh, character. So you welcome the people when they put on the headset. It's now a white room and like this woman is taking her hijab off and putting it on or whatever. And the other people, which I hope is representing the gaze, the societal gaze, are first looking at this woman. And the audience is also looking at the woman. He or she, the audience, whoever she is, he is, is the part of the gaze first. But then the gaze turns to the audience. And now he is the one or she is the one who is looked at. That's the point where I hope people would feel what that gaze means being looked at how it makes you uncomfortable and you are not doing anything wrong you're just sitting there you're supposed to be there i mean you know they called you you're accepted to this exhibition you're sitting there but still these people are looking at you in a way that you're not welcome there or like you're not supposed to be there so that that was the main thing i was trying to reach hopefully after the exhibition, after this was, unfortunately, because it was the beginning of the very beginning of the pandemic, it work stayed there like a week. I had a lot of feedbacks, both from women who are wearing hijab or not wearing it, or from men, actually, which make, made me really, wow, surprised, that they really felt that case. Of course, there were ex exceptions. Here and there, and that's normal. I mean, because like it's al almost impossible to make something work perfectly. And I I realized that with this VR technique, with this VR technology, of course, with the help of narrative techniques as well. I mean, it's not just I didn't just put people there and put headset on them and like here move. Of course, I worked on the script. I tried to figure out the the timing when how 
what should I write? How should I look? Of course, this is all like classical narrative techniques. But with the help of this technology, people are really getting it. And this really excited me, you know, because it's like before that, it was always really hard to communicate with a man or like with a woman who never used the job. There's always this something between us that never lets us to, you know, understand each other fully. And most probably in a different context or a different, I don't know, maybe I would never understand the transvestite men or transvestite women's experience fully. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that this is the only, you know, this is the only personal experience that people wouldn't get. But in my case, in this context, that's what I'm telling. Oh, I just wanted to comment on that. I'm just taking notes here. Um, it's interesting that you talk about how kind of the gaze that is, that is experienced in public spaces, no one can like say like, oh, that was an attack because it's so mm -hmm. just like a subjective kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. It's not like a physical confrontation necessarily. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of reminding me of like right now, there's more conversations about like microaggressions and it's becoming more of a serious topic now as well. Mm -hmm. And also I just thought, I don't know if you read the work of Franz Fanon. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, he wrote a book called Black Skin, White Masks. And I'm also really inspired by this book. And it's he's talking about his experience being Black in Europe. But he also, mm -hmm. how you say, like he wanted to kind of keep, he wanted to do the process of unraveling the the veil. He also talks about how like he's being stereotyped before anyone even meets him as a person and being mm -hmm. seen through these stereotypes. And he, I just have a quote that he writes that his body was given back to him, sprawled out, distorted, and dissected under white eyes. I totally understand. Oh, thank you for that, by the way. Yeah, that's that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes envy like those writers who are better at articulating my feelings <laughs> yeah. and we, we also got a comment from or in the chat and she okay. said oh my god the gaze really passed through even in the representation earlier when we were previewing the work she said i was literally feeling ashamed for something i didn't do by a group of strangers oh thank you that's that's a really powerful <laughs> comment yeah. thank thank you or and I'm, I'm happy that if it really passed True. Maybe we don't we don't need the VR technology then. <laughs> Just kidding. I think we really need that. You know those I remember do you guys remember like body shift movies? Like where like there are two siblings, they hate each other. Yeah. And all of a sudden they change, you know, they change their bodies. And now the VR technology made me feel like that. Finally someone is in your body. But with this project, it's almost like I'm shifting bodies with the with the other one. It helped me with that. Of course, I mean I know that there are, there's still like limitations. You know, there is this quote from Rumi, the poet, or like some you know, some people says he's a poet of great love poems, and some people says he's a he's a Sufi Murshid, uh, like whirling dervish, I would say. He's asked what love is. And he replies, you should be me in order to understand what love is. So I'm, I, when I, I mean, all the time I hear this quote, I'm like, dude, come on. It's kind of too much to ask from people to become you to understand love. It's like, it's almost like you're saying it's impossible to understand love. So when I finished this VR project, I was, I was thinking, Maybe now we can be roomies and like understand what love really is. That that was the hint for you guys to get help from digital arts to fall in love. Someone would make a piece about Rumi uh, to uh, with with VR technology, and we will finally know all what love is. Thank you for giving us such profound and like personal insight into your work as well. So maybe. It's a good opportunity to ask some questions and open up the conversation. So I'll start one with Megan. Uh, do you see your work fitting into a broader movement of reforming the gaze on veiled women? Well, if it, if it will have more uh, platform to be seen, I kind of started believing that because after the feedbacks I got, I realized that there's a more neutral discussion opportunity is given birth 
I, once I was uh, in the exhibition, and this woman came to me, came to me with her brother. She she was a wild woman, and she said I was I always had this problem, you know, communicating what I what I had been through with my brother, who is a man and who is also very young, and never been to that period. But now he saw your piece and he wanted to talk to you. He literally thanked me for, for helping him to understand her sister. And he was like really sincere. That was to me like one of those moments where I felt like, well, maybe this really could work. You know what I mean? Like maybe this really through this kind of work. I, and I don't mean just my work, of course, obviously. I mean, it's just a little thing. And it was my first try. But maybe through this kind of work, we can maybe take uh, the political burden of the issue and put it more in a personal context. From like all cognitive research I have been reading, I know that people get attached to each other or like people create bonds through not ideas, through emotions. There's this small church where they put in America, in the United States, where they get people conservative and Democrats and rate their, you know, political, how to say that, orientation first. And they, you know, put them into into a discussion room and make them discuss about um, certain issues in a very civilized way, in a very rational way, like where they all use like very profound statements and at the end of the discussion you would expect expect right they you know they talk in a very civilized way they you know state their hypothesis and they were you know very smart people and you'd expect some kind of a change right but at the end of the discussion when these people rate how much democrat they are now or how much conservative they are now they are even more like a democ say eight point democrat person became even more ten Democrat and the other became, you know, 10 conservative. Because the ideas usually separates us. Because they are like abstract concepts. But emotions are very basic. You all have them. Bring here two mothers from two opposite political location and like let them discuss about an issue. They would be in their corners at the end. But bring to mother here and let them discuss about how they discuss how they feel about motherhood, how they feel about if they are scared about their children because of COVID, whatever, I don't know. They would come closer. This kind of work, I think, could help women with hijab or women with headscarf, however you want to put it, to show like society that they are more than just hijab. That's, that's a person, actually, like you. <laughs> she has emotions. She has other stuff to do. She has anxieties. And there's not just one topic to discuss. And there's just not one way to look at it. Putting it this way kind of makes me feel a bit shy because it's like it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, exaggerating my work, which I, I really don't want to do. It's just these kind of works. I want to just underline that thing again. These kind of works can really empower women with whale. Another feedback I got from most of the women with hijab who viewed the piece were like, well, first of all, they all went out from that room crying, which kind of traumatized me. I was like, oh my God, I did something really bad. They're all crying. What should I do? I should hug them. So they were like, you know, this was the most common feedback I get. And I understand them because I have lived like that for a long while. They were like, you know, I was, you know, we were pressing this emotions down. We were like, okay, it's gone. I'm not going to think about it anymore. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's like they are like repressing what, whatever happened to them in which ways. And they finally faced with what happened to them. And I think it's the first step to heal and to become more powerful. And we all need to, I mean, as women, we all need to, we all need empowerment. What happened to us, let's accept it. And let's now create 
an identity on top of this because denial never works. It never worked for me. As Katie mentioned, the micro um, aggression. aggression, it's a way of abuse. I mean, I'm very, I'm very clear about this. This gate is a way of abuse. And this gate is, is built through state, through media, through the society, the very people we live together. And we should accept that, try to find a way to heal ourselves. We don't have to be aggressive about it. I'm, and I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't want to like shout everywhere like, you did this. I'm well past through that. But that was an abuse. Let's accept it. And let's move on. We need that for healing. And that's what I saw in those women who were coming to me and like sharing their experiences. That was a real moment, a very, very sincere moment. I had. I even had this woman who told me, you know, when the bystanders come circles the, the audience and looks at her or him. This woman, she went out, she was crying, I hugged her, and she said, finally, I had the opportunity, look back. Look back at them who are looking at me. Look back at the gaze, that, that societal gaze. Finally, I had that opportunity. That was really strong for me. So I think, yes, this definitely will help. And all these kind of works, maybe even like for other experiences women have, I don't know, like rape victims, which is a really hard issue, I know. Maybe we should try to include these kind of works or technique to our social politics. I have a question. Yeah. Do you have any plans to expand on this line of work? So obviously with this one, you're introducing the gaze and how it feels. Is there yeah. any plans to kind of then progress that to then show how the, say, the hijab women want them to be seen as presenting themselves rather than always seeing themselves from someone mm -hmm. else? Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely I have one where how media sees the hijabi woman and then we start turning around and like see all the faces of the same woman all the different activities she's going through something like that but it's still under construction and this is kind of a half joke but thanks that i now don't have the <laughs> rail i can be you know both veiled and unveiled version of the women in terms of performance, I think like uh, it will help me to go through that performance stages, and not just not, not just for whale women, by the way. I think then as women we have lots of other issues too, and this could be expanded to other experiences. Motherhood, that's my second issue. Like how society sees mother. I mean, I know there are cultural differences, but like I don't know in Eastern culture, it's such a pushing conceptualization of, of, of motherhood. It's like you have to be like all loving, all giving, all this and all that, and you don't have the chance to complain. Because when you complain, first the society, the people, whoever they are, are like, oh my God, are you complaining? But you have such a great... First this, and then you also blame yourself like you're oh my god i don't i shouldn't be complaining this is such a gift yes it's a gift but you're a human you know what i mean like so my second i think my second issue would be motherhood to explore through vr i just wanted to also ask a question that's more about the practical format of working with vr okay. You already had a practice, you have a practice as a filmmaker, and this is your first time exploring VR. What were some of the challenges or potentials that you okay. experienced when making this work? Challenges. Well, you have to, first of all, you have to control the whole space. It's a huge challenge. I mean, like, you know, classically, when you're working 2D, two dimensions, it's easy. Put the camera here. Great. Put the camera there. Great. But you put the camera this at here 
and you have to be controlling, you have to be thinking about the whole space and you cannot make changes. It's like that part really hard for me and directing all those people and thinking someone who's like, who's not there, like thinking their body. Like, of course, when you're like doing dramatic work, you always have to consider the audience, but the audience's mind you have to be thinking when you're working 2D. Dramatic writing always includes an audience. It knows there's an audience. That's for sure. There is an audience. So you are writing for the audience, but you are taking into consideration the mind, not the body. But this one, I should be considering the body. This person, when he comes and he sits, is he going to move his head? So there should be something there. When is he going to move his head? Maybe I should put a soundtrack, I don't know, to take him back here. To consider someone else's body in the work itself is another challenge to me, which I loved, by the way. I love, I love challenges because it opens up all the, you know, all the other doors. It's really good. Other than that, uh, well, specific to this work, because it's VR, but because it's the first time that I'm per- performing, it was like, uh, what's going on here <laughs> in front of the camera? I should be, you know, back of it, <laughs> back of it. But uh, yeah, I was performing. I wasn't paying attention to, to the people I should be. So that's, yeah, and if that's not specific to digital art parts. But being performer and the director and the writer, like multitasking was hard to me. And I'm not sure I'm going to do that very often. <laughs> Other than that, opportunities. I have been talking about the opportunities. I think. Mm-hmm. The only thing is not everyone has VR headsets. That's bad. I think they should be selling VR headsets in Superman. Everyone should have one. <laughs> if you include this as our, our um, social policies into social policies definitely send them a vr set and put like different personal experiences in the vr set and pe- let people just be someone else every day daily now i'm a transvestite <laughs> now i'm a black woman now this and that like why not i think that's a good idea um i have one more question if if no one else has anything they want to ask but do put something in the chat box or unmute yourself still if you want. But I was just curious how, because there's been protests in Istanbul mm-hmm. over violence against women. We've seen the Instagram campaign mm-hmm. with Challenge mm-hmm. Accepted. Mm-hmm. And I just um, was wondering if for if this is going to affect the way you think about, you know, your work. and uh, Well, I mean, of course, because it makes it, of course, it has always been in my agenda like violence against women and children. And now it's getting more and more visible and it makes you think even more about it. My short movies that I am working on totally, like solely about this violence against women issue. And it also provokes your emotions, I mean, you know, like it touches your emotions because like almost every day you hear a woman is being killed. Almost every day. And this is like, wait, what? What's happening here? It's not just an intellectual thing to discuss about it's like it's emotions because you want to know who is next is it me or is it my daughter like what's going on here so of course like these protests are making things more visible and i hope like artists would be more involved issue in their works because that's another way of setting agenda not just protesting in the streets, right? Like putting the issue into your work, uh, but not as a not as a propaganda. That never works. I mean, if it affects you, take it in. Don't feel shy about it, which I made for several years. I felt really shy about taking my per- personal issues into my work. But, you know, stop being shy about it. And if it's affecting you, Try to work on it and make it more visible to to people. And that's the only way to have a good ground to discuss and to understand each other, I guess. What's your next project, by the way, if I was wondering? I'm working on a feature length movie at the moment, but it will take like, takes like four or five years, write it and then funding, etc. So 
Meanwhile, I'm also trying to make a short, like in six months. That's also about women issues, women's issues. So it's bringing together a very conservative woman and the transvestite woman, how they exchange their ideas about womanhood. So that's like a 20 minutes piece. I have already written the final draft and, and I'm trying to find funding for that. And hopefully it will be finished before February. I, I'm not sure, but hopefully. Mm -hmm. So I'm also interested in like this digital arts stuff, VR, specifically VR. So I am, I'm thinking about bringing together like dance, narrative, and VR. Like, uh, I'm, you know, I'm still, um, how to say that? constructing it like i'm still thinking about it yes. but my main focus on vr is now bringing dance into it how i can bring movement and a uh, human body and also objects like how you can melt that into one moment and to to also make it um uh make it interesting in terms of vr technology because uh, seriously, I'm, I, while I I was working on this uh, talk, like thinking about what should I share with you guys, I realized uh, I I think we are is giving us a really huge opportunity to like share our even our body bodily ex experiences in terms of maybe neurologically. You know, I have watched a lot of VR videos where you are like falling down. I don't know flying, those stuff, and you, your body reacts as if it's in the real situation, mm -hmm. like as if it's really falling down, as if it's really flying. So if your body reacts, this, this means it's more than uh, just weaving something and like uh, processing the data intellectually. It's mm -hmm. more than that. So I think like uh, this, VR is really, the VR technology is what I really uh, passionately seeking for in terms of sharing the experience. So I, I am looking for a choreographer to work together uh, to make how it feels to be in a woman body, but in Turkey, like specific to this culture, mm -hmm. what it means to be here, a woman, you know, in her thirties and has all this, all this backstory and try to m make it a dance movement and share it through VR technology, hopefully. Like these are three things that I'm working, a feature length script, a short movie and this dance VR project. Well, thank you so much. It was a really fabulous uh, conversation we had with you, Elifida. Most of us, we all experience at some point some weird gaze at us. I like the manner you transpose this feeling and uneasiness, particularly from a perspective of a Turkish woman in Turkey. On behalf of the Agora team, I would like to thank you uh, for coming today. And I want to thank as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, come back anytime soon. Take care. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you for joining. Hey, I'm never gonna forget you. <laughs>